Raj, thanks so much for for taking the time. I've got to say, it's like it's it's an awesome. Um, I feel I'm going to get way more than you're going to get out of this because I I read your books at university, mm. like when I was first getting into wine, the the secrets of the sommelier. So it's it's yeah. a surreal experience for me talking to you through a screen. Oh no, it's it's great. I, I wish we were sitting right next to each other having a glass of wine, but there we go. Next time next time De well definitely next time we're in the states several times a year so and i, I love the states and i'm actually kind of i've got a growing fascination with new world terroir and just outside of new world terroir really the, the concept for me of new world versus old world is a little bit redundant my personal view is that it's all just dirt you know and and, and seeing producers that are translating that in really really interesting ways and of course and this is for everyone that's that's sort of watching this there's going to be a fair whack of assumed knowledge to to this conversation because Raj, you have a a reputation that precedes yourself. You've done a lot of things in the industry, and I was trying to explain it to a friend of mine who actually isn't involved in wine, and he got back to me and goes, "Yeah, mate, I know he's got a Wikipedia page. You know, <laughs> you know when you've got a Wikipedia page, you've done a few things already." But I wanted to talk to you about the stuff that you can't find already in another conversation and the thing that really piqued my interest which is your transition you've you've moved from sommelier your author of two amazing books both of which are on my sort of mandatory reading list if you're getting into wine tasting but also like at the nerdy level your second book which is like especially if you're already into to, to wine like that's next level reading and and i think mandatory as well but farming You've you've done the you've done the thing. You've moved from all the way from customer focused all the way to to well not customer focused. How's yeah, yeah. how's how's farming yeah. going for you? Ah, it's good. It's it's the opposite of what you're saying. Customer focus and and my you know I spent 18 years interacting with guests and and the world out the consumers and and training and all this other stuff. But you know I I think I think it was the obvious shift because you know when you you know someone who some people and a lot of people are like that they they want they are thirsty they want to learn new things and that's me and i will keep learning keep pushing and when the pandemic came i was like this is the best time to kind of you know leave the crazy world of traveling three hundred thousand miles a year and and being at every major event and speaking and all kinds of stuff, you know, and and just hunker down in you know a very small little community, a small little town with two thousand people, and uh, just hide out and kind of learn something I've never had a chance to do. It's it's because uh, it you know it's it's uh, you know I literally had no experience and no knowledge when I moved to Cambria in 2020. It was literally just like you know opening a brand new book and studying a whole new subject because when you when you when you when you read about farming a vineyard when you talk about farming a vineyard when you think about farming a vineyard it's very different than actually farming a vineyard and when you say farming a vineyard when you're literally farming a vineyard like literally doing all the sprays and doing all the pruning and leaf pulling and literally four and a half hectares with one other person helping you and you kind of create your own box. And this box I created was, you know, you know, it was like a empty box with nothing in it, just me. And this one person, amazing guy who was helping me, who was the ranch manager of the of this of this vineyard, who's been there from the beginning. And then I decided what tools will I bring into this box? What are my tools? You know, how do I, you know, and and that was the hardest part because, you know, you, we all live with principles and philosophies and, and ideas. And I have slowly kind of incorporated different ideas. But one thing I was sure was I did not want to do it the way it was done. Mm. That, that, and nothing against the way it's done. I just did not want, I, you know, I did, I did not want copper sulfur 12 to 14 times a year. And we are done. I was like, that's not going to happen. So I'm like, let's take what the complete opposite to that would be is how do we improve plant health, soil health, and our small ecosystem we have in at Taylor Farm? How do we change that naturally? You know, just with holistic sprays and, 
and soil management and and try to produce grapes. And I tell you, it's it's, it's a pretty incredible challenge here in Cambria because I had no idea how cold it was going to be. I had no idea how wet it was. And so, you know, it, it was, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. And slowly I've incorporated many tools into this box. And now we have other people in this kind of sphere we have inside of this. So, you know, and we do, do different things, different years and kind of learn. It's, it's all about learning and sharing. So, and there's nothing about this is wrong, this is right. It's just what I want to experience in this journey. Mate, there's a lot I've got to unpack there. So take us back to you're coming into Cambria, 2,000 people. Like you're, you're uh, you know, if I would imagine you're walking into any kind of restaurant of, of repute in the States, you probably don't need an introduction. People will kind of know who you are. Is it, was it something you were searching for at that point in time? Like I imagine when you're walking to a town of 2,000 people, no one knows. No, nobody cares. I love it because they shouldn't because... I believe all humans are equal and as whatever we do is that's our journey and everyone should be treated the same way. So it was, it's been an amazing, you know, it's been an amazing time here and it's a small town and also moving here deep in the pandemic, it was really, it was, you know, really kind of a time you wouldn't see that many people and also at the farm at the time, it still is the same. There's no houses, there's no roads, there's no phone service, there's no internet. So you're literally, you know, in this place by yourself. And and it really is a very special experience. And and that really kind of changed me as who I am because well, I do love people and I love to cook for people and entertain and stuff. But in this instant, it was just like me. And it was it was really amazing, and yeah, it was refreshing. Still is. So was it something you were craving at that point in time as well? Just the I know it's it's sort of weird, a weird kind of sense of isolation, but in a beautiful. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think we as humans know what we crave until we actually get it. So oh. now, if you put me in a room with like a hundred, two hundred people, I feel uncomfortable. But it's like because because I don't see like like. I see the same four or five people every single day. It's our team, you know, and and uh, yeah, when I go out, I see, I see people, but it's 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 not it's not like uh, it's not like it's not natural for me to be around so many people in, in these days. And you know, I, I, I like small, intimate settings. And yeah, it's it's different. So obviously, you've adjusted to to life, obviously in a much smaller town. How has the town adjusted to you? Oh, is it because you're doing some farming well, in some, some ways that would challenge a lot of people's conceptions of farming, and we'll get into it, but have yeah. you had any kind of local backlash? No, there's not that many. There's, there's, you know, we're very, I mean, Cambria is a small town. There's only a few small farms around here, and there's one beautiful, or few beautiful organic farms here. Yeah, people are like-minded. There's the, the farmer's market here is, you know, focusing on organic, the local grocery store. So it's very much in the same ethos. There's no, mm. we have no fast food. Like there's no like McDonald's and Starbucks and Cambria. It's really special. It's, it's like, you know, it's a small little town, but it's like everyone has a similar idea. It's not, it's not like, uh, there's no like big stores with stuff. It's really special. What an amazing community. I was surprised uh, when I was reading, and I, I didn't know, I knew about Felon Farm, I knew about, you know, all the range of different sort of brands and, and things that you've been involved in. When I got to the, you don't spray copper and sulfur part, I even I started to freak out. And I was curious because we're planting out a, a vineyard at the, at the uh, and questioning. And it is a bit of a different thing when you, uh, you know, from a winemaker that just sources grapes to being actually responsible for land. It does change the, I guess, the sense of either urgency or importance or intensity that you start to make these decisions because they're sort of forever. And I was thinking of people that were reading about your method of farming for the first time without actually having read any of your literature or know anything about you. They could come away thinking that you're being hyper philosophic, but you've never struck me as being a philosophic person. You've actually struck me as being an outrageously pragmatic person. Even what you were saying before about you, you got to a farm, you're like, all right, what's in my toolbox? What what can I do? What, what, what are my competencies here? How can I apply these in the best possible way? Do, do you feel what you're doing is philosophical? Do you feel that it's being just practical? So 
again, I take it back to a personal journey. The reason I didn't use copper, I would, I just can't use it. I just can't do it. We have animals. We have we have sheep grazing, and, sh and if you spray copper, and the, res the residue is going to come onto the plants, and the sheep are going to eat the plants, and they're going to die. So they're very sensitive to copper. That's the reason why there's not them that much grazing happening in in European countries because of the use of copper. Uh, it's a heavy wow. metal. It's a heavy metal that never leaves your soil. Anyway. It is what it is. And we get downy mildew. It is what it is. You know, that, that's fine. We don't we don't get the same amount of, amount of downy mildew like Europe gets, but we get it in the in the early months and during flowering and we lose. Last year, we lost almost 80% of certain vineyards. So, you know, but I'm still not going to spray copper. That's, that's kind of out. Sulfur, I have nothing wrong, nothing against sulfur at all. The, I, think, I think it's, you know, it's fine. I just wanted to kind of go to the extreme, right? So if in 21 and 22 and 23, no sulfur used. In 24, we used a small dose, very, very small dose, and only in two sprays, and it worked. We don't want 100% clean, you know, we, we want things to live. We don't want to kill things. That we, we are, you know, I tell the team, we, we, are, we are here to farm microbes. You know, that's, that's, that's more important because... What's outside the grape is more important than what's inside the grape, right? What's the, the mm. all the microflora, all the fauna around what's growing around is what's more important because that that's the in, the in the final wine. What makes a wine, what gives the wine the X factor is that amazing energy. And where does it come from? It comes from the microbes. So excessive spraying of sulfur will take it away. And nothing wrong. I mean, I've had amazing ones that I've, we all had that I've had sulfur sprayed many, many times over the season. I just want to have, I want to have my own guardrails, right? So how do I stay safe, but also not kill anything around me? That's the reason so, we didn't use it. So you mentioned, obviously, cold place. You, you underestimated how cold it is. You underestimated how wet it is. Like the downy mildew impact, is that, do you see that as being long term sort of problematic for, for having just a sustainable model, like a financial model? Or do you just kind of, all right, we made a little bit less. Do you have like a price per hectare? I'm, I'm curious, like, is it a price per hectare every year? And if you don't make X amount of fruit, the price naturally goes up. How do you kind of it, it, put, the, put food yeah. in your mouth? Yeah, you know, we try to get better every year at it. You know, and we try to, you know, learn from the plants because nature always mm. teaches. So certain plants, we are doing trials on pruning and early pruning it very, very late. And how are we going to prune it? And, you know, when are we going to mow it? Are we going to crimp it? When do the animals going to go in? It's all these things. We are making mm. small adjustments to kind of stay ahead of it, but still trying to stay in that natural path. Now, you know, in a, in a small scale, we can do it. If it was in a massive vineyard, it'll be much harder. Mm. You know, and we also have we also have, you know, six different vineyards now, seven different vineyards. So, and they all they they range from um, they range the smallest one is point seven hectares, and the biggest one is. Uh, Seven and a half hectares. So is this outside of Phelan Farm? This is the oh. the the and yeah. No, this is no. This is all in Cambria. Wow. This is all. So so I started with four and a half hectares. Then I took over another vineyard. Uh, there was nine hectares, and I planted another three. So in those nine, there was two different parcels. So you know, we're kind of like. And we sell a bunch of the grapes now, and this is the first year. 24 will be the first vintage when we have the added, the new, uh, you know, I planted a new vineyard, mm. which is very exciting, um, which is, again, totally experimental and, and probably was done, you know, I don't know, a hundred some years ago. It's basically bush vines with the attempt. Let's not say it's, it's not done yet. We just planted it. So with the attempt of creating a bush vine with a fruiting zone, at five or six feet. What? Yeah. It's that's an a, attempt, that's... but that's an attempt because then 
animals can graze. I can have yes. sheep or I can have pigs. Again, these are this isn't it's you know, it's three hectares I planted. So it's you know, we'll see what happens. In three years we can uh, we can see what you know how far we've gotten. So I suppose you could always cut it down, miss a vintage and then like, if 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 it didn't work, you could always turn it into actual bush vines. It'll work. It's just it's just how high <laughs> you can it's it's well, definitely you could, you could... It's it's gonna work. It's just it's just that how if we need and without any wind the Wow. So it's so, again, you know, we are gonna make adjustments as needed, but right now it's basically gonna be like a vine orchard. <laughs> Dude, so, I've got so many questions. So I mean, okay, we've got the the farm uh, uh, soil biota, which which is topical, uh, I think, at the moment. And I want to get into how you ended up there, but if you're establishing, I want to this 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 tree vine thing. Is is fascinating. Did did you did you deep rip? Did you, or did you just plant a hole in the ground and then just went for it? Or how? No, no, we did, the, the year before, you know, is, you know, we practice regenerative farming. So we're not we're not plowing the vineyard. We had just we did one deep rip, and then we cover cropped it, left it, you know, just let it be, and then we just this July we just dug a hole and put it in there. That's it, done. And we have yeah. temporary irrigation this summer and we'll pull it out either next year or the year after let it go out I, I, I use a pretty vigorous rootstock so it'll grow and also i picked upright varieties that that like to grow up yeah so gamay that's, that's oh and granger uh we, we call them var varieties with an e uh in australia um yeah. wow so that's so Obviously, farming farming soil. There's this always this concept of no till. Is no till no till? Very misleading. I think I think I think it should be used very carefully because if you tell someone that there's just not going to till at all, yeah, in some vineyards you can do it. Some agricultural lands you can do it, but if you don't do anything at all, magic won't happen for a long time, and you might not. Yeah, yeah. You might not get a crop for a long time. So it just depends. It depends on how patient you are, how many reserves you have, and how you can, yeah, like like Phelan had never been ripped, never been plowed from the beginning, planted in 07, it was own rooted. And, you know, we did some we did some digging and saw some, you know, there's definitely a compaction there. So we are going to do a little, uh, we're going to use something, you know, the, you know, the yeoman's plow? Which is yes. something like that, kind of a deep shank, just to yeah. break, kind of like a root pruning, just yeah. to kind of aerate, just to kind of aerate the soil, but not to kind of. So that's that's probably going to happen. The, the, that was like my last thing I wanted to do, just to kind of aerate the soil, because we we now we know there's there's pretty heavy compaction because the soils are clay based. But then we have to make sure we do that in the winter just before the rains and we have a cover crop right after that so it's important to kind of not leave bare land mm. it's the most important part not to leave bare land so if you do have to do any you know i mean of course we don't do any tillage in the summer months and you know it's only just right in the end we'll do this one deep rip and then after that cover crop and just let it go so, so in effect, the whole sort of no, because I uh, I'm nerding out about it at the moment is more. There should be like an addendum, which is no tilling for weed control, no tilling for leveling land, but tilling for reducing compaction. What we would call knifing, knife or uh, um, is sort of a. It's more like a, a a tool to if you're using it, it needs to be benefiting the soil, not necessarily. Been like a an arbitrary thing, like we'll level the soil so your tractor doesn't bump um, yeah, or yeah. weeds no. because you just can't yeah, be bothered. No. It just it just depends who you speak to. Like like I've been kind of, you know, kind of reading and trying to follow the ROC, the regenerative you know certification organization. So kind of and and it depends. Some like if you talk to Kelly Mulville at Picenus, he is more regimented. He just refuses. To do anything and and well, so that that's his so you know it just depends on how severe and hardcore you want to be because uh, you know that sometimes you have that balance you know 
you know, sometimes you take an old vineyard and you stop, um, you stop telling it, and you do stop doing anything on it, and you know, it, it's it starts it, it struggles. Sometimes you we have an old vineyard we work with in in L.A. and in, in Temecula hasn't been tilled probably in fifty or hundred years, and it produces a great crop. So it just depends on on mm -hmm. where you are and how established the root system is and also you know what kind of treatment the the vineyard has gotten so how long have you been doing these sort of this sort of i started in 2020 and within the last 4 years have you noticed any yeah in the wine <laughs> well yeah, the wine just has a lot more energy the wine has just exuberance and balance and Great, you know, no problem with fermentations, and yeah, it, it takes very much of the place. You know, if you've been to the place, you find aromas from the place in the wine, which is obviously the goal. Yeah. What, what impact of that would be the farming, and what impact of that would be the fact that you're probably getting like point zero zero one? Uh, no, not we don't get that that low yields every everywhere. The low yields we get is because we lose a lot of of the of the fruit. Either 22 drought or 23 when we had an early outbreak of of uh, of downy mildew and we couldn't get in the vineyard because we had, we had this we have to cross two streams to get into the vineyard two creeks. Oh right, so you yeah. Got flat. Those are different stories. Uh, this year everything looks like it looks okay. You know we will get you know maybe a ton ton and a half an acre, which is like oh that, that's you know so you know it's 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 still low but. In the other vineyards, we get a normal, like, you know, we'll get like, I guess in hectolitre per hectare, we'll get like, you know, so at Phelan, we'll get like, you know, 15 hectare per hectare, but at the other vineyards, you know, we'll get 30, 35, even 40 hectare per hectare. So. Are, you, are you the only owner of Phelan Farm or you? Yeah, no, just me. Uh, it's just me. I started alone and then over the last four years, uh, we have a small team of five now. And uh, yeah, so now we are, you know, it's 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 it's, uh, it's now a sixteen hectares total, with the new vineyards. So you know, wow. it's one person. That's not a small. That's not a not a small one of land. No, no, it's not it's, not uh, farming the way that you're farming it. That's that's. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 you now we have a super team and and just kind of you know keep dialing it in, just just learning new things and. And try to dial it in, make sure we can just stay afloat right now. With the and that's like the biggest, biggest thing. And you know, and you know, the, the biggest challenge here in 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 California is that you know most people don't differentiate between vineyards, uh, you know, the, the vineyards you farm and the grapes you buy. You know, so for mm. the consumer, everyone thinks that you know growing grapes is the same as buying grapes. So it, it's got to get tough out there, you know, and, and it's it's and and even the most wine writers and whatever wine critics, whatever you want to call them, uh, nobody ever says anything different. So, so the narrative is very hard, you know. Whereas in, in Europe, the same people will give advantage to like buying grapes and not buying grapes. So you know, it's just kind of a hypocritical situation here, but it's just the way it is, you know. You live you live in the society you live in, so you can't really change that much you know but i suppose it's also to a to a degree and and i think wine for people is this is this is a personal like expression of yourself there's that this form isn't it um you know at the end of the day this is the way that you want to farm as much as the general public might not see the difference hell even winemakers often don't see the difference i remember working at a exceptionally large winery and grape receival uh come in and ask where the grapes came from and the guy turned around and goes mate grapes come on trucks don't you um, yeah. and, you know, the connection to, to land is, is certainly something that I think is, is on the hundred percent. And, and, you know, if you come back to the thing is like, people ask you, oh, why is your wine so expensive? I mean, how do you answer that question? I'm like, uh, I, I, I don't know. It's, you know, for, I mean, it's not like if you're selling hundred dollar bottles of wine, but even, you know, it's like maybe $10 more expensive than someone who bought the grapes for whatever the, you paid, paid for them, also from mm -hmm. organic. But the relationship is different. You know, you're pricing at, you know, if you get 0.5 tons 
an hectare, or if you get ten tons of an hectare, so, you know it's it, it, you know you can't change the price if you're not living in Burgundy or Bordeaux. You you live with the price you've given the wine, and if you get frosted, or if you get a dry year, or if you get whatever, you're just going to live with it. You know, so it's and that that many people don't understand that that relationship. It does it does it frustrate you now knowing the amount of work and effort it is to do what you're doing and get? I don't think your wines are expensive at all. I think in the context of American wines, your wines are actually on the the, the more approachable end of the spectrum. Um, but only a couple of hours away, there'd be conventional farmers spraying the living bejesus out of their grapes and getting hundred, two hundred dollars a bottle for it. Does it does that? That oh, yeah, a lot, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's just, you know, all these conversations we have, you know, about whatever, if it's, if it's cores or if it's, you know, natural wine or whatever, the, 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 I think everyone must pivot to soil health because we all live on the same planet. You're in Australia and I'm here in the United States. It's the same. If you go down, we go down, all go down. It's not, it's not like soil health. And everyone has to pay attention to that because we are consuming all these, you know, things. And if you're using herbicides and pesticides, the runoff is going to go in the same ocean. So, so I, I think that that's the problem is that everyone is looking at only out for themselves, not thinking that we are the same human race that has eradicated so many species of the planet, and we've done that because we just could. And we wanted to either eat them or just because they were like a pest or whatever. We eliminated so many species and and it's all part of nature. So, you know, it, it, that's kind of, uh, yeah, I think of it. That's the whole reason I got into farming. Was I'm like, this is like, not that I, my small 16 hectares are going to make a difference, but, you know, it's it's just to kind of bring some awareness of really what, you know, how how people should behave and how, you know, they need to act. It's funny, like the 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 underestimation I think of the the doing the little thing uh, in a spot of the world. Um, just this week, because uh, we've been struggling, we we yeah, um, and it's uh, converting uh, apples uh, here in the industry so well, and they they uh, irrigate it pretty heavily, pretty heavily uh, by necessity actually based on market conditions, uh, and we're trying to recuperate it. And they have these like three to three point two meter uh, like row spacings. And I'm coming in there going, we want to do two meter row spacings. And the growers are going, nah, mate, nah, that's impossible. You'll never be able to drive around it. You'll never be able to, you know, and it's, it's starting to, as we're planting it out, it's starting to make other local growers kind of go, maybe we could, maybe we could control bigger by, by just decreasing row spacing rather than trying to control it by ear. And, and a lot of these sort of little things start to fall into place as, you know, your neighbor looks at your neighbor, he looks at your neighbor, and it starts to sort of spread out a little bit. Sometimes when people are in their own little, especially in rural areas, I guess, people are in little thought bubbles. They, can, they can't see outside of that. They kind of need someone to come in from the outside to kind of take a risk. And I suppose with yourself, you've, like, Felon Farm's not the only thing that you have going on at one time so at least you've got a, a decent amount of diversity you know so uh, i imagine i imagine if if this is the things like if you get what you're doing to work there's no excuse for most other people to start yeah i mean there's few few, few other people doing this kind of stuff so it's just you know it's you know you gotta make it work one way or the other because at this point you have you know when i was alone i i didn't really care much but now you have you know, you have a team and you got to be somewhat responsible and make sure, make sure be, you know, but still kind of living in that, the same kind of, you know, the toolbox of what you can allow into it and what, you know, how far will you go to, to make it all work? You know, that's, that's, that's a personal question everyone has. So that's why it's hard to judge people if they do something different, because it's not, you know, everyone has to make a, make a living and everyone has to uh, survive as long as you don't harm the planet. I'm I'm cool with everything else. It's just, you know, I have a, I have a problem when when you have no you have no you have disregard for 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 nature, which is the most important part of our being.
Was there a genesis point in your sort of career when you started to to have these sort of thoughts about nature, thoughts about farming, thoughts of things differently? Was there was it a plane? Was it a, a a conversation you have something? Were you walking somewhere through a vineyard and you thought? No, you know, it was during the pandemic. It was just looking at, you know, it all came down to like you know wondering why we ended up in all of us locked up in in rooms, and that's where the that's where it was born. I was like, this is crazy. How can all of humanity just go to standstill. Like, well, how did this happen? And that was kind of a, and I was, you know, traveling and doing doing stuff I, I used to do. And and I was like, this is, we have to stop and stop, you know. And so I, I said, I'll, I'll stop and, you know, let's see what, you know, road that takes, you know, takes us on. So it was, it was that. It wasn't any one, one wine or one place. It was just, you know, and then kind of there was there were many people who who kind of guided me through this, and people who uh, mostly by reading and you know, you know, reading Fukuoka's book and reading, you know, listening to Dr. Elaine Ingham and and uh, and uh, you know, meeting Kelly Mulville and Dr. Christine Jones, who was who I just uh, I went for her last. Uh, uh, she had a small workshop, and so you know, just and you know, and just you know, and then reading Michael Phillips' books, the the Orchardist, you know, just 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 trying to kind of see if what is really you know what's the heart of farming, and and sometimes you have to look outside, you know, you have to look at you know other people who are doing growing other things like apples or or rice or whatever the case may be, and kind of look at them and see how they do it, how did they kind of you know, do it outside the box and say, how do we kind of farm grapes outside the box and not just, you know, use the same, same things as as we have in the past? And and it was just that exploration of, you know, yeah. So did those? Because I've seen you mention Masanobu's stuff before, and he's uh, you wouldn't believe this. My father actually does farmland. Um, and I gave him that book, uh, and he's been using it to be able to change up his sort of farming systems, not realizing that obviously Fukuoka, like, but, uh, it was, um, yeah. you know, quite, quite a, quite an age book or it's time. Was that, was that like during the pandemic that you were getting into reading these books and doctor, there was a new one for me. Uh, I've been nerding out about. So I actually read, uh, Fukuoka books when I was on vacation in like, <laughs> in uh, Vietnam many years ago, so it was I was in a small island, the South China Sea, and I was just, and that's when I read the book, and I read this same book like five times, and I was like, wow, this is completely bananas. So it was definitely very, very um, moving at the time. So then that kind of stayed in my, I bought that book for everyone I knew, and and. Uh, and and then uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham was in 2020 when I moved to uh, Cambria. That winter, um, I was living in this big house with a friend of a friend, and I was running a huge house by myself. And and, and at night I should just sit and read. And so I bought a lot of you know Rudolf Steiner books and a lot of you know other like books on Indian farming or about about just just farming as, you know, uh, and, and so I listened to podcasts and I came across her podcast and I, when I was working in the vineyard, you know, I listened to all her podcasts and then I was like, wow, this is, and then I finally, and I reached out to her and then I found this, one of her consultants, cause she has many consultants and I, and I, and I, I started working with him and he taught me how to make a compost. And then he's to, he's the one who did all my analysis. You were asking how we do, you know, fungal and bacterial analysis. He he does all of that. He's the one who kind of taught me all these different things. And yeah, it was like you know, like what you know, what does it mean to have a positive fungal bacterial ratio and 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 so all these little things and the, and all but listening to podcasts and reading, you know, Michael Phillips' books, the uh, you know, he was an apple grower in Vermont, and you know, I learned like how do you make a lacto ferment, or you know, how do you like you know 
what do the fish and mushroom do? And, you know, what do you do with neem oil? And, and then I use some of the Ayurvedic research from Indian growers of, you know, the use of turmeric and the use of, uh, of honey and the use of, uh, you know, again, a fermentation with, 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 you know, I, I, I added, you know, some, some ocean water to, to a salt component to kind of, so all these things, we were like doing all these trials and I, you know, I learned how to use a microscope. So it was just like a rabbit hole. You just kind of go deeper and deeper and figure out what works. And then plants loved it. And when you're spraying, when you're spraying all these natural products, the plants like enjoying it and, and the spray smells amazing. I lived a whole <laughs> year, we sprayed only milk, you know, milk and then and then when we saw some heavier mildew we spread some cinnamon oil 22 was a vintage you know we just and uh because of the dry weather you know we, also you don't irrigate uh we kind of had a small yield but the wine was amazing it was like really like concentrated and 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 it was like pretty much you know mildew free because of the use of milk and and cinnamon oil so you know like that that was so every you know, every year we do different things, and this year we had a kind of a slightly different program, you know. So it's just like experimenting on different levels and kind of trying to figure out, you know, where your guardrails are and and how can you push it by spraying as little as possible. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what uh, what was, you know, yeah, that's what's been happening here. I see what if we if I jumped on a tractor and started spraying. That had no had no cab on it, had no cab on it, and I just started spraying in our area. I would have every farmer driving by stop off, thinking that I'm nuts, and especially when I turn back to him saying, "Matt, I just have to enjoy the smell." Uh, people are really going to think that I'm because everything that's that gets sprayed around here, can't panic. Oh man, uh, you know you you simply wouldn't want to be smelled. And I was actually going to suggest. Let me let me let me just add one more thing. <laughs> I didn't even use a tractor. I was going to ask about this. So, so obviously, soil compaction is is a big thing. Yeah, we start with an ATV to go go to an R R T V. Yeah, really. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I need I need photos of the setup. I'd like to try to replicate this uh, in the Adelaide Hills. I reckon. I reckon it worked in the small in the four and a half hectares. It's much more challenging to do it in the in the nine hectares, and also the the steep hills gets a little bit. Gets a little dodgy. But I mean, you have a mono tractor now, so yeah, it's you know if if it's small, you can do a lot of different things. If if you get slightly bigger, you just gets you know time becomes yeah. So it's you know um, and also weight. You just don't want the tail wagging the dog when you're spraying. Yeah, yeah. But I was drinking my coffee and spraying all open. I have like video <laughs> like nothing. I was like, I three years. I was I'm fine. What? <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. How did you find the milk sprays worked? Because milk's made to... Really to... No, really yeah. good. Raw milk, really good. Hardest part is finding raw milk. Yeah, 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 but if you get a cow, then you have to, like, you know, milk it, you know, every day. So it's... uh No, I mean, we got a... And, you know, in, in America, it's brilliant. You can't buy raw milk. You can only give it to you for free. You can buy guns, but you can't buy raw milk. Vega. We'll see you. So I want to. So some of the the stuff outside of farming. Obviously, we mentioned. So you've got San Domaine de la Cote um, a farm. You've got uh, are there ones that I'm missing? Sardine and Wineco. So yeah. So so San Domaine de la Cote Evening Land. I am less involved in. I help more in kind of more in the blending or if they need any help. I'm kind of removed from daily operations and winemaking and that kind of stuff for now it's just been i have yeah it's just been you know i'm i'm always in cambria so i don't really get out that much i'm still a partner in them i just don't i'm not uh and sashi's you know he's he's been doing it with me for so many years so he's this and the whole team is all set up so you know it's uh so i kind of focus only on on Felon Farm, which is now has some new vineyards. And then we have, so Stolo is the new vineyard we acquired. So it's part of Felon Farm. And then Scythian Wine is uh, kind of an exploration into uh, the past. So we work with some really old vineyards east of LA. So planted between um, 
1905 and 1918, all dry farm, bushmine, own rooted. Uh, so Palomino and Zinfandel, Alicante, and that kind of stuff. So, and um, so, what? Why? Why were? How, how were these? How does that happen? How does? How does? How do these vineyards? Uh, I understand how they got planted. I understand why. Well, there were forty thousand acres, and now there's six hundred left. Some there's been producers, the Galliano, who's kind of been certified organic forever, and. And they've been making wine for those vineyards for since the 20s, 1920s. Um, and, and, and and they've been, you know, they're still around. They, they, look, they, have, they have a, you know, much larger picture to, to vineyards. And then there's, you know, other people who made wine. Carol Shelton, who buys the grapes from the same vineyards. She made wine there for many, many years. And it's just like, you know, just... These vineyards were not accessible. It's not like, you know, they were like families made the wine and they sold the wine and it was gone. And me and Abe got in there and then Mikey, who actually grew up there, Mikey from Scar of the Sea, Herman York, who are these this three amazing guys who make wine. They live uh, not far from there. You know, so there's, there's a bunch of young people kind of coming in and trying to kind of make wine from these, you know, old and forgotten they've been there forever it's just that we just found them so it's it's an amazing story and, and the vineyards are you know they never get any sprays of course they all are dry farmed and they just get pruned and picked and it's uh it's truly profound like it's really really incredible is this something that you potentially might see as replicating with felon farm as in if you, if you could go back to if you were to go back to those, those vineyards in the 20s and they're making decisions as to what variety to plant, where, why, how. You know, they're obviously dry farming it, which is determining the grape variety because it's not like everywhere. You know, um, the fact that they're dry farming it is um, uh, largely suited to the climatic conditions of that area, which impacts, obviously, fungi, weed distribution, so a lot of like your pesticides, fungicides, herbicides are largely based on one controlling factor. I, is this what's fueling a lot of the plantings at Fallon Farm because you've planted? Yeah, I will see. I, you know, I, I definitely admire what, what happens. Our weather here is, I don't think, I mean, yeah, I mean, my goal is one day to get to that five to one fungal bacteria ratio. We don't have to spray anything. That'll be magic, but you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, uh, Wait, hold that thought. Five to one, and you don't need to spray anything. Is that like a? Is that a thing? Is it? It's like if you hit this point, then yeah, you found... pretty much. That's what Dr. Elaine Ingham says. We so when we started at Phelan, we were negative, really negative, and now my last we are positive fungal to bacteria, and I'll do a test again in uh, in the fall and see how far we've gotten. So every year, you the goal is that you're moving in positive fungal to the bacteria and then so the plants are just a lot more self-sustaining and healthy because you know the, the bacteria because as as we are as humans we have more bacteria cells than human cells in our body and then that's just the way we are you know so uh, you know how do we kind of strengthen our microbiome by by not eating poisons and not you know having antibiotics and other things sometimes we have to because we have you know you know, also, also have to live. So, but but then you kind of, how do you kind of create that self-sustaining? Because it's been proven that age is not um, something you know. People look young, and why they look young? Because you know, they might be you know what they eat and and what they don't drink or whatever the case may be. But it's inside, you're aging from inside. So when you when you have these illnesses. It's all you can't see it. It's it's inside. It's same thing with with the vine, and how they look, and that's why the you know when you look at a vine and you see an organic vineyard and you see there's no red leaves, there's no yellow leaves, and you're like, wow, this is that beautiful organic vineyard. But you know you can, you can have the same effect as by uh, having uh, sprayed uh, some pesticides and you look green. Oh wow. Be- beautiful it's not because it's the same thing as if if you're like having steroids and you're building your body to be like you know super strong and it's different than a natural person who's kind of building a body by working out and so it's it's a interesting comparison 
So it sounds to me like this sort of five to one ratio is a little bit like integrated pest management, but at a sort of microbiological level. You're, you're trying to get the microbiome to be resilient enough to be able to combat any sort of like downy mildew that pops up. Exactly. That's why a vineyard that has in never seen antibiotics will get will get to that ratio much faster than if something has has been uh, sprayed with with herbicide. It just it's just the way it is. You have to aerate the soil more. You have to you know you know we we, we have to put a lot, literally inject with uh, with compost extracts and different different things fish fish emulsions and different things that the microbes can eat and kind of thrive on and kind of build and and uh you know stay happy talked about uh, and i like the um uh and that's that's super fun uh, uh way to be able to sort of understand it obviously we talk a lot about sprays the impact of sprays the impact of synthetic chemicals now moving back to organic chemicals uh, and the impacts of those as well what about irrigation it seems to fly under the radar a little bit do you do you... it's the million dollar question because uh, if you did have irrigation i don't think we'll have a california or i don't know uh, wine industry in any warm part in the world. I think that there's a certain flavor profile in the wine when you have to irrigate and it changes, you know, it really changes. But without water, you know, nutrient cycling is very hard because it's just there's no moisture in your three, four inches. So if you're living, if you're on pure limestone or pure diatomaceous, on pure, any rock in your, in your first you know, three, four inches, it's just hard for it to really, like, you know, I have a good, good example of a vineyard I went to in Kornas, and Kornas, as you know, is all this de decomposed granite, from pure granite, decomposed granite, and anywhere you go, it just looks like it's like a hard, kind of reddish brown soil, and it's like this little pebbles, and it's all granite everywhere. And I went to this guy's vineyard, his name is Cyril Corvassier, small producer and he had a vineyard he planted and no like he didn't you know like he hasn't tilled it cover crop it and we went there i think it was in the winter and way high up on the hill of cornas and he wanted just dug in there and he got pure hummus pure black clay I didn't even see any, like the rocks had all settled down and it was so much organic matter. It smells so amazing. I was like, wow, because it was completely like a little oasis on top of a hill and the, his neighbor right above him and right below him. And we walked up and we did the same digging. It was full of just sandy decomposed granite. And he had built this amazing topsoil just by cover crop. Wow. Yeah. So just, just recently yeah. to... And the wine is insane, like completely insane. Tiny producer, yeah, it's right. like, so hard to get those bottles, but it's like just that, like just what, you know, and it's just, you know, yeah, no, it's, it can be done. It's just, and you know, I mean, I mean, irrigation changes the dynamic of what's growing also, because you have a lot more growth happening under the vine at that point, and you have to keep using clemens or cutting out the vine or you just whatever you can but the the wrong kind of growth happens at the it's not you know if you irrigate you're, you're not getting cover crops not coming up it's going to be like you know the stuff you don't need depending where you are so it's it's just it's a different it's a you know it's, it, it looks very different than so our vineyard like the the new vineyard we just took over and luckily we have you know when you have heavy clay, so it has good water holding capacity, and we haven't irrigated there in seven years. And the new vineyard, which has the temporary irrigation, I just can't wait for it to go set up and get that out of there. And also, it's a dense planting is was fashionable, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's still in some places, but now you have to go back to, as you're saying, two meters by two meters minimum. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Scything Wine Co. Old vines since like the twenties, dry farms, Californian wine industry. With no, hundred like... percent. No, but but you have to sacrifice. You know, I mean, I, so not far from us, Paso Robles is just here. Over the last ten years, since I've been here, a lot of the old vines is getting ripped out, and and with dry farm old vines are being ripped out, 
and people are planting, you know, Cabernet and Syrah, dense planting with irrigation. Yeah, because, you know, Cabernet is, is you know, is, is Cabernet is king, you know. So that's the thing. Cabernet and Pinot Noir, these things, everyone wants it. So people are just so it's, planting. It's, it's, it's more trending. It's like like a commodification of yeah. wine yeah, is it, driving. It, yeah, if, if, if you're going to, if you're going to plant a vineyard, plant something that works in your in your favor for the future, right? This vineyard I just planted, I'm hoping it'll outlive everybody. I mean, depends how long our planet exists, but, you know, but like the, all the new, if you're planting a new vineyard, you should plant like Mouvedre or something like that with bush vines and, you know, just minimum inputs and not rely on water because water is going to be gone in our lifetime or the next but it is going to be you you can't just you know get endless amounts of water because it's just you know already people are uprooting vineyards because you know they need water for um for the housing the house they have or and or you know drinking water not for the vine it's funny a a lot of the you know talking about the commercial reality we're having a conversation with a grower who we worked with it was actually a a previous grower we worked with to sauvignon blanc to fiano big fans of fiano um and they sold that vineyard the grower was he was getting getting on in life and he to one of his neighbors whose uh mission in life is to plant a thousand hectares of chardonnay Uh, and so he's grabbed this And so uh, he's um, top worked all the Fiano, this this glorious vineyard that was now ten years old and and could be dry farmed from any any point in time, um, producing pretty reliable yields with very minimal inputs, and he's top worked it all back to Chardonnay. So that's that's all gone now. And when trying to negotiate with this new grower, so well, why wouldn't you keep the Fiano as a hedge for for the years that we have? You know, strata drought years. It's not dissimilar to California, Adelaide Hills. Um, the simply, well, we're getting good money for Chardonnay, um, and the question never really comes up, which is the thing that we're starting to ask more and more: is well, for how long? How long are you going to get good? Firstly, if you're going to plant a thousand hectares of the thing, you're probably going to that price is going to get diluted pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but also for what are we talking about? Three years, ten years, yeah, fifty. Yeah, and 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 once you've top worked it, you can never do it again. I mean, if I had, I have so much information now on graphs and how to, and I made so many mistakes. You know, I mean, literally, <laughs> if someone is ever graphing, I'll I'll give them so much information because the argument is grafting or planting. You know, it's of it's course many, many different things, but that's that's a whole different topic. Well, I suppose the other the other advantage we have in where we are is own roots stock in South Australia, um, courtesy of just a big did phylloxera from entering, um, you know. So we've got a, a few other that we can push and pull on. Um, it sort of seems like, you know, you said something in one of your interviews, which is really which is wine is generational, um, and it's enough of the industry is taking a, fo- a generational focus right. on how they're planting, how they're farming, how they're... We're all just struggling to, to um, obtain something that I don't think is obtainable, which is we all want to be billionaires, but we're in the wrong game. Uh, <laughs> time yeah. is the only fact. Anything remotely like that to you. Um, you know, how do you... Is that what you're like, felon farm for you? Are you kind of putting this generational model around? Yeah, I, I want I want these plants to live for a long time and that's 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 the reason why and this is my first vineyard I ever planted by myself and you know it's it's a uh, I'm gonna do one more I have one more vineyard to replant just because the health of the vineyard you know um but I also want to be very cognizant of of you know the environment of like if you're planting a vineyard you know if the vineyard's only or it's only like 25 years old and it's just you know has trunk disease and that kind of stuff. So, but when I replant it, I want to be more like conscious of what we are replanting it to and how we are replanting it. So the same this vineyard right now and and trying to eliminate the water element out of it. You know, it's like yeah yeah, you could you could use water for it to grow, but not relying on you know, uh, you know to also get. Uh, to also, you know, we don't need to like look for massive yields and just keep watering the plants to get the biggest yield and 
you know, definitely in, in what, I, what I'm trying to do, and, and I'm, you know, 51 years old, I'm not here to, uh, you know, I, I won't see the results of these vineyards, but, uh, but I want it to be something that's going to be there for a long time. And that's why I always worry about grafting in the future. If I was going to think of a long-term vineyard, I would be more, um, I would lead more towards planting than grafting. Just because, well, why? Why? Because uh, the the cut is a pretty severe cut when you cut the plant. As you make that major cut, plant has, you know, it ha it has a timeline. You've kind of made that cut, so you're gonna, you know, one part of the plant is gonna, you know, the staff flow is gonna completely be diminished, and you have to like renew it and be really take really good care of it. You can do it. It's just it's just, you know, it's it's not going to live 100 years, you know. Interesting. So, so, so that's good. It's entirely, like, we can graft, uh, you know, we, we know grafters. It's like a voodoo science. You know, some grafters get really good strike rate, some don't. But but you're thinking past the graft dead now. They, they grafted it ages ago. Uh, and now you're thinking, is this fine actually going to? Yeah. 100 years, probably not. But if you... If you if, if you if you replant it uh, the right way, because also now with this dry weather, you know we have to rethink our rootstock and re rethink all these different things. But also, you know, if you really want to get fruit quickly, yeah, maybe you'll mm. get well, you'll get some fruit. But really, uh, if you do the math in five years, plant versus a graft, you'll pretty much equalize in five or ten years the yield if you think about it. Of course. And what about bush vine? You mentioned bush vine before as like if people are planting. They the, the, the... Nah, you know, I think I think not all varieties work with bush vines, but I think that that's the most natural way a plant grows, you know. I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, if you go to Tenerife, they have the braided vines, you know, and that's their, the worst, the, you know, the, the and then you do the provenage and it's just it just depends where you are, you know. Out there it works with the wind and, and it can, making the row as long as you want and it's such a great way of managing your plants and i just love bush wines it's it's you know i'm fortunate we make a, a movedra from a from a hundred year old uh bush vine on granite and it's always like i love that vineyard just so much it's, it's uh, middle of nowhere and then we make some grenache from bush vines and it just you know it's just because the plant is completely on its own it's 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 how you prune it, and that's what you're gonna get. There's not a whole lot you gonna, you know. And and it's you know, cane pruning oh. is a little different because when you're cane pruning it, you know you you know you let nature decide a lot of different things. You can of course adjust it and shoot thinning and stuff. But in bush vines, you prune it, and that's how the vine is gonna produce. And it just self, oh, yeah. you know, just creates its own arc. Versus any other style of pruning, you're dictating it. Uh, right at pruning and that should thin. It's it's interesting that, that there's been another sort of dichotomy in my own sort of headspace on this where, you know, because if you look at Vitis vinifera, how it evolved, you know, it's evolved in, in to, to use other trees as a vine, you know, use other trees as a trellis. So it's a naturally, you know, it's going to strike for a trellis. That said, I've never seen, I've never seen a 150 year old Vitis vinifera leaning on a tree. Um, I've, I've definitely seen a lot of 150 year old bush vines though, which really goes against, I, I imagine like how it's actually evolved purpose. We seem to have somehow managed to find a, uh, this interim, uh, you know, was I in that yeah. way? Well, it's, it's, and also with, you know, but also if you sometimes look at some, wow. some bush vines and, you know, I mean, the plant is growing to go towards the next bush vine and they sometimes mm. meet. You know, of course, you know, most people hatch it off and clean it up. But if you go to some of the vineyards in Cucamonga and in east of LA, and you just see that the vines are creeping towards the next vine, or in Temecula, we work in the vineyard plant in 1896, and a lot of plants are kind of climbing up the tree. So we used to ladder last year to harvest a lot of the grapes from the trees. And it was amazing to see that they all are moving towards the other plant or the tree, whatever is close by. And I mean, you know, the best indicator we have in California are the redwoods, 
And if you go to, you know, I drove Brother Edwards uh, the other day and in Northern California and, and you know, just see the redwoods all grown, they grow in clumps. They're like six, eight of them all together. You can't even see whose root system is what. And they kind of, the root system is fairly shallow for how tall they are. But you see them all going to arc together. If, you, if you're driving on the road, all are kind of moving towards each other and they've created these arcs on the road because it's the shade and they want to kind of connect and go high up. It's, it's nature is fascinating. It's just unbelievable. Well, we've been chatting for an hour and I've, I've got some questions that I absolutely have to ask you that um, I'm, I'm being, I'm being uh, self-serving here talking all the time, but I've, there's a couple of other quick. Oh, wow. I, I wish I could get higher alcohol. And just we pick as late as humanly possible into November. And that's just how ripe you can get. It's just, it's just not, it's just not, um, it's not warm enough. It's not like I want to, it's not like I'm picking early. We last year we started picking on October 9th and the last pick was November 9th. Yeah. They were, it was just like, even, even the gamay was picked on the 23rd of October. And it's not even like your yields are high. It's not like there's, they're going on either. Well, they no, should, they should... no, last year was like half a ton an acre. The three-quarter ton. And, and but that, that's not sort of been like a cause for inquiry? Yeah. I, I you know, have zero, uh, you know, the, the, the wine is the afterthought of the farm. Mm. It's like a it's, byproduct. Yeah, we happen to grow grapes, and that's what we make. And, and it just happens to be okay. And it's just, it is what it is. We don't have anything, you know, we don't ha have a sorting table or a shaking table or any temperature control. We don't have a heating jackets or cooling mm. jackets. Or, so everything is just whatever. And it ferment outside in the sun or up the bush. And, uh, so it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's very, uh, yeah, it's old, old fashioned. We don't, we don't need a pump once only for a pump over. That's it. You know, and you, you bottle everything by hand gravity. So yeah, it's just, just very simple, you know, as, as a few big business, not like a overly thought out with a one analysis of the line just to make sure it's out of the barrel and that if that one analysis, uh, the racket to tank day or two before bottling it, and that's it. You know, really, it's not like uh, you're not like checking things. You're not obsessing it. over over the minutia. It seems no. it's a different type of minutia. You've already obsessed over it in the vineyard, so you're not really yeah. kind of. Oh well, yeah, like, yeah. We don't do many technical things that that's you know it's it is what it is they don't really uh yeah because it's you know the they, it, the intention is different you know we all have different intentions the intention is to farm at the highest level the intention is not to make the greatest wine in the world yeah so when we when we start well when we start our first fermentation the pea the cool the apple wine is different. We do a co-fermentation of apple cider and grapes, but when we, we our first peer the cool we start is usually with all the wild flowers, all the wild berries we have growing around the vineyard, what? leaves leaves from all the trees around us, and there's piece of wood. So we yeah we start a non ferm a, a non saccharomyces non grape fermentation, then we'll put when we sample grapes put it in there. To start that to ferment, and that will be the cool for the first lot. What about squirrels? Wow. And then after that, it just because we have enough, we have enough yeast population in the cellar, and then we come. So only for the first, first will be the first and second pick, and after that, it just rips after that. So, do you think you'll ever? I don't know, probably not. You know, that wine is, you know, it, yeah. No, it's also it's it's you know, um, it's not a co competition of any sort. So I would like to have the most beautiful vineyard and happy animals. That's it. Nothing. 
Yep. Well, yep. if you could go back to your younger self, knowing knowing what what you want to achieve for the rest of your life, but if hey, you know, I I'm pretty content with what the way life has been. I would probably I would probably be slightly more open. I was very very focused on like obsessive about Burgundy, and I kind of totally ignored other parts of the world. So I would have I would tell myself to be slightly more slightly more open, maybe embrace, you know, embrace. And I also, it's like, you know, don't like focus on so much on work, you know, really, you know, because for the first, I think, 15 years of my life, I didn't take a real vacation, always in a wine region. And it was just a little bit too much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Raj, thank you so much. Uh, especially, I know how busy you are. Uh, farming, farming hectares, the way that you're farming it is, is scary to me. Uh, but to be honest, it's just been absolutely uh, hearing about the trials, the tribulations, um, and just even giving me some amazing, uh, ideas on, on how we can potentially farm. You've got me thinking maybe. Yeah, please. Yeah. Come visit. And you know, it's, it's, it's a journey, you know, these, these things we do and we discuss and, and we implement and then. You know, we change the whole thing around and then do a different thing and or try a different things. So it's, you know, it's always something which we never stop learning from. So yeah. Are we gonna say I don't know. No, it's too definitive. I can't. It's like you know, I don't want to be it was right to it was fun to write about amazing people and amazing vineyards. I'm not sure I wanna to, wanna to, uh yeah, no, it, it would it would be too much too much of a uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe something more lighthearted. Uh, I'm not sure about what farming, but we'll see. All right. Well, I'm going to let you get back to your day. Thank you so much. Well, what's what's planned for the rest? Oh, oh, we just finished that. So he's waiting for Virgin right now. So, uh, so it should be very soon. And uh, no, we've kind of pretty much done most things. Just uh, kind of caught up. So now we are just. Uh, Waiting for variation, and that's pretty much all we have going on, and then the imminent harvest. So it's going to be kind of an easier couple of weeks from now on. Before it all gets busy again. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, mate, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to see you sometime out in Australia. Uh, we found out just before actually chatting that you've actually got a, a wonderful Mac Forbes, whom uh, ourselves and the entire